Hello everyone, I'm Robin Pearson, and I'm here to show you what remains of the Hippodrome of Constantinople. This is the last of our four-part series. We will take a look at the tallest monument from the Spina, the Masonry Obelisk, before moving on to the other places in Istanbul where you can still experience the Byzantine Hippodrome. If you haven't yet, check out part one of this series where I introduce the Hippodrome and explain the significance of the Spina. Standing proud at the far end of the Hippodrome is the last surviving monument from the Spina, the Masonry Obelisk, or as it's often referred to, Constantine's Column. We know very little about its construction and installation, but many assume that it was put in place by Constantine I when he founded the city, because he couldn't get hold of an authentic Egyptian obelisk in time. If this story is true, then Constantine settled for this gigantic facsimile made from limestone ashlar blocks. At 32 metres high, it's as tall as any of Rome's obelisks, and as we discussed in part one, that seems to have been the point. It may be that in imitation of the Eternal City, an obelisk was meant to face the imperial box, but scholars still aren't sure which of our two monoliths that would have been. The ashlar blocks decay over time, requiring renovation to keep it in the firm state we see it in today. This helps us understand the inscription, which can be found on the giant base. The four-sided marvel of the uplifted, wasted by time, now Constantine the Emperor, whose son is Romanus, the glory of the kingship, restores better than the ancient spectacle. For the Colossus was a wonder once in Rhodes, and this is now a brazen wonder here. The Constantine referred to here is Constantine the Seventh, often referred to as Constantine Porphyrogenitos. He lived in the 10th century, long after we believe the obelisk was in place. It seems that by his day, the obelisk was also in a shabby state, and the decision was taken to sheathe it in bronze, both to better preserve the stone and to give it a more dazzling appearance. The inscription likens it to the Colossus of Rhodes, now that it stood proudly restored, gleaming in the sunlight. Most likely the bronze was looted by the Crusaders, leaving the blocks unadorned once more. Don't let anyone tell you that that's all there is to see of the Hippodrome. Make your way past the masonry obelisk and head downhill towards the sea. The Hippodrome's location was fine for a small city, but once Constantine decided to expand it, he ran into a problem. Existing buildings to the north meant for the racetrack to expand, it had to push south. But as the land approaches the sea, it slopes down sharply. The track couldn't be relocated as it had to adjoin the palace. So the Romans decided to build an enormous substructure to ensure that the racetrack could stay where it was and remain level. This structure is known as the Svendon and sticks out of the landscape today as a monumental tribute to Roman engineering. Initially, a series of massive vaults were installed that formed a colonnade, but after an earthquake damaged its stability, it was decided to fill in the arches and add buttresses to better support the weight of the Hippodrome. This left a small corridor on the inside of the structure unused and fairly inaccessible so it was turned into a cistern. Holes in the wall still allow some water in, and in the recent BBC PBS documentary Ancient Invisible Cities, we were given a glimpse inside. 
According to the show, this cistern was capable of holding up to 10 million litres of water. When you've finished gawping at the Svendone, turn around and head into the nearby Nakash carpet shop. There is an excellent exhibit in the basement all about the Hippodrome, including beautiful reconstructions of the statuary that once decorated the Spina. And it's free! Finally then, head to the Istanbul Archaeological Museum to see the final few pieces. There are some small remnants of the Hippodrome's decoration on display, but the most exciting item is the top of the head from the Serpent Column. Sadly, not on display when I visited are two statue bases from the Spina, which the museum owns. These bases once held statues dedicated to Porphyrius, one of the great charioteers of the 6th century. The discovery of these bases helped fill in a lot of the information we lacked about the Spina. I recorded two special episodes of the podcast about Porphyrius and the Hippodrome, which you can find links to at the end of this video. Sultan Ahmet Square is a very busy tourist area. If you want the monuments to yourself, you'll need to go early in the morning. If you do go down the hill to the Svendon and the museum, then why not visit the former church of St. Sergius and Bacchus, or the Bucolian Palace while you're there. They're both nearby and absolutely worth seeing. And all of these places are free to visit, including the museum. If you'd like more detailed information on the monuments of the Hippodrome, then visit thebyzantinelegacy.com. It's a fantastic website providing breakdowns of the Byzantine buildings that can still be seen today. And there, you'll find most of the still images and sketches used in these videos. If you'd like more information about the chariot races themselves, or the famous Nika riots, then check out these episodes of the History of Byzantium podcast.